these sort of came out of nowhere in the NAS world. I remember as much as two and a half, three years ago, they were nowhere, you couldn't find them, and all of a sudden, they're everywhere. <laughs> Hello and welcome back and I'm continuing my theme of NAS hardware while I'm waiting for these eight different devices here to reboot. I've been pulling an all-nighter so I apologise if I look a bit frazzled but today I want to talk about the importance of CPUs in NAS devices. It's one of the deciding factors that a number of you above capacity will factor when buying your first, second or tenth NAS device. CPUs change from NAS to NAS, I mean Again, unlike a number of brands like WD or Drobo or Amber, that one that we featured on the channel a while ago, these devices don't really sing the praises or talk about their internal hardware, rather to keep it very, very secret and refer to it very tenuously. But then at the same time, you've got brands like Synology, QNAP, Asus Thought, Thekus and more who sing the praises about the CPUs inside their devices because what they want to do is let you know the hardware you are getting. But do you need that CPU? You know, how do you know whether powerful is powerful enough or that you're just going overkill when spending money you're never gonna need? So I'm gonna focus on four main kinds of CPU. These are general terms that, that pretty much every NAS device out there has. I'll try and focus and point at some of the devices behind me to give you classic examples. But first and foremost, let's go for the lowest grade of NAS CPU that you can find these days in modern NAS. So again, we're not going to look at PPC and you know really, really basic CPUs. We're going to look at first ARM-based 32-bit CPUs. These are pretty much the lowest of the low. These are less efficient. I mean, they are designed for longevity and low power consumption, low hardware degradation over time, and basically being left on for ages and ages and ages. These CPUs can often be found in mobile devices and of course can be found in NAS devices. Behind me, of all of these devices here behind me, you'd think which one of these has an ARM based CPU? Is it all of these devices? Well, it's this one, it's the Drobo. Drobo is a NAS brand that produces devices for photo video editors and often because they don't have a lot of apps and they focus a lot on the first party stuff, they can really tweak that hardware accordingly. But a number of you do not know that older Drobo devices had 32-bit ARM CPUs. That is an older Drobo. It's one of their first NAS devices. But ARM-based 32-bit CPUs are there for low-scale backup. They can still be utilized for a number of other devices. And older NAS devices still feature them. Over here, I've got some rack mounts. And I've got an RS812. And that features uh, an ARM 32-bit CPU as well. But what is it for? Well, you're never going to be able to use it for Plex. So get that out of your head. If you try and use something like that for Plex, performance is really going to suffer. Also, although it can run Plex and it can run music and DLNA applications, it doesn't multitask very well by modern standards. Uh, particularly more demanding modern devices that are far more graphically enabled, that CPU will lag thoroughly. When it comes to backing up and simple file processes, as long as you're doing you know, standard file level backups on multiple devices at once without too much going on, you should be absolutely fine. It doesn't multitask very well. And of course, you're not gonna get IRM 32-bit um, graphically embedded CPUs. They have an equivalent, but not really. You can get them in dual and quad-core CPUs, but there's still no denying it is not a great nano CPU. You'll find it very much at the bottom end of the spectrum and very rarely in modern times will you find it in more than a two or four bay NAS. Which brings me to the next level up and a relatively new level in NAS CPUs. This is 64-bit ARM chips. These sort of came out of nowhere in the NAS world. I remember as much as two and a half, three years ago, they were nowhere, you couldn't find them. And all of a sudden, they're everywhere. Behind me here, we don't actually have, to my knowledge, any ARM 64-bit CPUs. These devices here, we've got everything from i3s to i5s to Intel Celerons, but we have none of those. Now, uh, ARM 64-bit is the same principle with an enormous difference. It is an incredibly capable energy-efficient CPU. It's still not, you know, it's not as big as some of those Intel ones we're going to talk about later on, but for file management, they are great. You will find a lot of 64-bit IRMs in SFP-based NASs that use 10 GBE SFP, so Pfizer. That's because the file handling and the floating point on these 
is significantly better than their rivals, uh, their, their predecessors to 32 bit, but with the caveat that it is much more file led for quicker operations. And that's something that fiber SF, uh, SFP based 10 GPE really benefits from. That said, there are a number of CPUs from companies like Realtek with the RTD 1296, RTD 1295, and others that are graphically um, graphic enabled. They have an embedded com um, hardware transcoding engine that some of them can even transcode 4K media. I'm looking at things like the DS218 Play from Synology and the, I believe, the um, QNAP 128, uh, 228A, but double check that one. There's a lot of Realtek CPUs out there that can transcode. In fact, we've started seeing Plex becoming available on these CPUs to play back 4K, though it will never transcode 4K in Plex because it's a third party app and all that. We'll leave that to another video. But these are much more uh, becoming a hugely attractive and affordable option. In fact, even Synology, a brand that is incredibly rigid about their hardware architecture, has, you know, in their 2018 series, adopted a number of Realtek 64-bit CPUs in their AM, uh, ARM series. You know, the 118, the 218 Play, I believe even the 418 features them as well. And they are becoming incredibly attractive. Also, with that extra graphical enabled component inside, they can do a number of the tasks that Synology and QNAP demand of them. In the, in the case of Synology, things like surveillance, uh, video playback, and even their moments and drive applications can run very well indeed, as well as, as we've mentioned, Plex running static will run on those devices. And QNAP as well have been really eking out a lot of the performance on those CPUs. But what I will say for 64 bit ARM chips is they, although they can do a great deal more than their 32-bit um, contemporaries, they don't do very well with multi-user uh, multi access. And the, the cores themselves, apps can't be spread across those multiple cores very well indeed. If you are using software that lets you use multiple cores, so that's opposed to having multiple cores that are running different tasks at once, 64-bit ARM NASes will not deal with that very well. And if you don't have experience of those, you're not going to get that out of an ARM 64-bit chip. Now, let's move on to the big guns, the ones that PC builders will be very familiar with. 64-bit x86 base CPUs. These are from your Intel and your AMD. We're going to break these down into two different versions. We're going to go for ones first that have no uh, embedded graphics. None, they're not graphically enabled, they're not transcoding enabled, they are hugely powerful, but they don't have that ability behind them. Now in previous videos I have mentioned that some NASs are hugely powerful, but they're not suitable for Plex, which seems really daft when you think about it, when it should all come down to power. The reason is that one of the most uh, difficult things that Plex will ever have to do is transcoding. When you're playing something on a CPU and you need the file changed and reformatted and reshaped, or you know, if those that are familiar with the software Handbrake will know, if you need that file changed to something bigger or smaller or a different format, the CPU has to work a lot harder, and that's where a graphically and um, graphic embedded chip and a graphically enabled chip will come largely to your benefit. But if you don't have a CPU such as a number of the Xeon series um, or some of the uh, Ryzen um, sevens, some of them don't have a transcoding engine built in. The result is that these changing these reformatting uh, actions mean this, uh, the CPU has to do that in a software engine, which means it has to use an enormous amount of power to do a task that a chip with a little side portion of embedded graphics will just hand that over to that. It's the same when you have a, um, a PC rig uh, with an enormously powerful CPU, but no decent graphics card. The result is that as powerful as that CPU is, it is not the job for the task. You're using a ladle to stir a cup of tea you're doing a very poor job and it's not gonna do what you need. That said, if you're using a 64-bit chip for file operations, large-scale business operations, or virtual machines, where you're not gonna be using a graphical component or something for editing and that, then you will find a number of CPUs are very, very good for this, if they're using third-party software, of course. Don't get me wrong, some VMs are obviously gonna be more graphically demanded than others, and that's somewhere where an embedded GPU may be advantageous, particularly for using a NAS for multiple things alongside those VMs. But as far as powerful CPUs go, if you aren't going to be doing something that you consider graphical, 
which I know seems like an abject co abstract concept, then these CPUs will be enormously beneficial to fast internal um, operations. If you've got SSD cache, if you've got multiple RAID arrays at once, if you're exchanging data within the NAS or um, doubling up or zipping up data before you send it via 1GB or 10GB and you want to remove any internal bottlenecks, then that kind of CPU would be enormously useful to you because you're not going to be you know, relying on some GPU component. You're going to be using the core strength of the CPU and its cores, its hyper-threading the works to get the job done. Which And these CPUs, again, predominantly, I look at the likes of uh, Xeon CPUs, which are used a lot, and some Pentiums, but not all. Um, now, if we move over to the other kind of Intel CPU, uh, AMD as well, x86 64-bit chips, we can look at Celerons. We can look at the i3, i5, i7. We can look at those CPUs that we, when we are looking at large-scale virtual machines, when we're looking at Plex transcoding, these are the CPUs that matter. Same with AMD as well. AMD has some great a, um, graphically embedded chips though their Ryzen series is more about power than graphics it does still have that support on there but some of the ones with a, a Radeon R6 or R7 embedded uh, component on them in those Intel CPUs I'm sorry those AMD CPUs and the Intel ones these are the ones these graphically embedded chips or the ones with hardware transcoding that you Plex users should be looking for now what you may find when buying NAS is if you want those CPUs, you never find i3, i5, i7s and uh, AMD Radeon based CPUs. You very rarely ever find them in smaller NASs. The smallest you'll ever find them is four bays, but then you have to go to four, six, eight, twelve and rack mount to get those CPUs. They are not cheap. And also, if you want a two bay, they you instantly get cut down. Very rarely will you find those chips. Then you'll have to settle for a Celeron. But Apart from that, if you can micromanage the storage capacities that you're going to require, then chances are these are going to be the ones for you. So again, if you're interested in Plex, go for those ones. If you're interested in file transfers for business as quick as possible, go for a pure CPU with no embedding. If you are going to utilize a CPU for backups and stuff like that, and you're not too focused on multimedia, then a 32-bit IRM might get by at 32-bit. But if you want a nice affordable level point, for a little bit of everything, but not really push the boat out on much, you can still get away with a 64-bit IRM chip. I hope I haven't lost the thread too much with you guys today. Again, this is a last minute video. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you've got any questions or maybe ideas for other videos, do let me know in the comments. But otherwise, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time.